They thought it was meningitis, so they were doing all the tests, chest scan, head scan, bloods, everything. Um, then he's like, right, get on the bed, we're going to do a lumbar punch in the spine. So I was like curled in a fetal position and uh, you could see like the doctor was like shitting herself because she was feeling my back. Because I got very thick spinal erectors, she was like trying to feel my vertebrae. I was like, please, and it my spine like to be there. So in she went, prodding, pushing, pulls it out. She's like, oh, I can't get any fluid. I'm going to have to go in again further up. I was like, oh, right. She goes in again, second time, can't get any fluid, pulls out. She goes, right, I'm going to go third time. I can't get it. I'm going to call the neat assist. She got on the third attempt, came back, fluid was clear, and then literally set me over past the So I went home. Yeah, got home, literally sat on the sofa. Phone goes, can you come back? We found back to you in your blood. So I went straight back to the hospital, and that's when I went downhill. And I was in intensive care. They tried putting a CMAT mask on me, um, which they were putting on like a lot of COVID sufferers, which is basically when you breathe in, it blows oxygen into your lungs. It doesn't work as effectively as it? <laughs> it was making me breathe out on my own rhythm. Because yeah. every time I was like, because I was breathing so fast, because I was, you know, obviously my O2 stats were like 80%, so it was on like four litres of oxygen. Um, it was making me breathe out of rhythm. <clears throat> so I had them take the mask off. They put me on a normal mask and then they blue lighted me over then to Morrison Hospital. Four o'clock in the morning, um, I was on morphine, fentanyl. I was just wired up, to, like I had everything. And then basically, they came and done a mobile echocardiogram, which is a scan on your heart, like an ultrasound, and they could see a mass on my valve. And then next minute, I got seven doctors that bought my bed. And uh, this is exactly what he said to me. He's like, "We don't know you're alive." He's like, "You've been in acute heart failure for two weeks." He's like, "We don't know you're alive." He's like, "If it had been any of us, we'd be dead." Yeah. He's like, but you're so physically fit and you're so physically strong. He's like, that's that's what's, that's what you do. He's like, uh, we've got you on so much diuretics because your heart is offloading water. If we carry on, you'll have kidney failure. He's like, normally we'd give you antibiotics for two weeks and then we'd operate. Basically, won't be in two weeks. So we've got 24 hours. If we don't do something in the next 24 hours, you're not going to see the next 24 hours. And he said, your valves are obliterated. And he's like, personally, you're in, you're in a bad way. I'd get your affairs in order. So you can imagine, I'm, you know, Fuck you're in intensive care. So he's literally own. saying the chances of us pulling, yeah, yeah, pulling, yeah. pulling you through this is uh, slim. Yeah. It? So I just, I didn't know what to do. So I just wrote my will on my phone. Wrote my will on my phone. Uh, made a video for my daughter because my daughter's in private boarding school in Dover. Mm. Made a video for her. And then I had to get my father on FaceTime and my sister. And like, you could see my father was like trying to hold it together. My sister was like breaking down. I'm like, look, they told me to get my affairs in order. I don't know if I'm going to survive the surgery. And uh, I'm going down tomorrow morning. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Club Iron podcast. Today, I'm joined by Mr. Alex Knott, and we are joined with, by a very special guest. We have got in our possession the Welsh shredder, Mr. Neil Arms. Neil, welcome to the podcast. It's Hi. good to have you on. Thank you, guys. Um, yeah, this has been this has been something I've really been looking forward to. You've got such a, a unique story, um, so many achievements to speak of, and, and your mindset as well is, is is good. And the stuff you put on social media is very informative and valuable to a lot of people. Um, so I know you've got a couple of topics that are very juicy, and we're going to jump into. But um, I just want to know how did you go from gymnastics to bodybuilding? <laughs> yeah, a lot of people don't believe me. Um, first love, I think, was martial arts when I was younger. Kickboxer, very good kickboxer, very good karate. Bruce Lee, like my all-time goat, mm. uh, my idol. Um, and then as I transitioned into school, it was gymnastics. I think I was good at everything. I actually, not being like big-headed, but I was good at everything I put my mind to. I just had that kind of mindset. Like I was beating like brown belts, black belts when I was a red mm. belt in karate. Um, and then school, it was gymnastics. I just never conformed to like the normal sports. I never liked football, never got into rugby, even though I was a, a fast runner. Mm. I was good mm. on the wing. Just probably didn't like the cold, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just uh, didn't like conform to them sort of sports. And my father's a massive football, massive rugby. Um, and then through school, just gymnastics, represented county level three times mm. in gymnastics. I was captain of the gymnastics team. Then obviously basketball, another massive love. Michael Jordan, again, one of my idols, um, just his mindset and yeah, all through school, captain of the basketball team as well. Mm. Very good at that. And then always obsessed with like you know muscles and training and Arnie and you know, all them kind of things growing up so yeah just kind of always like kind of dabble with a bit of weights mm. but yeah I think uh it was a transition from gymnastics to um to basketball 
Mm. And then when I left school, that's when I kind of went more into like sort of training and mm. just doing it as a hobby. And then very naturally strong, done a bit of uh, powerlifting, broke the Welsh British bench press record. Um, nice, nice. Done that. And then just weren't for me. And I just thought, you know what, I'm going to train for a year. I'm going to enter a, a natural show mm. next year. And that's what I did. I trained solid for a year. And then I competed uh, in 2004, my first ever show. 2004, when I was a, a, a very mature three years old. <laughs> I know this. Yeah. This, this is a, it's quite a moment for me because I haven't told you this, Neil, but uh, you were the first bodybuilder who I was exposed to in person. Um, I think it was December 2021. I joined Kicks for a month. All right. And uh, I was there with one of my mates, and um, I was in the you know the back room where all the like the leg presses, yeah, the hack yeah. squat, and I was there, and uh, you walked in, um, and I just thought, what the fuck? You were just there with this massive arm shredded. I was like, yeah. oh. the quads are getting, yeah, me. it's always a quad. It was the quads, the arms, and I was like, you were the first bodybuilder I've ever seen in person, <laughs> and you were just absolutely, absolutely jacked. Um, yeah, I think I was the last time yeah. it could be did, 2021. Yeah, and it was it was the first real exposure I've ever had to a bodybuilder. Yeah, I did um, a 10-week prep, that was. Yeah, just like 10 weeks out, I thought, come on, it's just started doing cardio. I just thought, right, come on, let's do a show. Mm. I was just eating pizza for five weeks out. People don't believe me, but the boys will back it up. But yeah, was, and my mate was like, look, you need to stop eating pizza. And I was like, fine, <laughs> yeah, fucking you know, show. Fine, fine. So I just went to zero carb then, zero fats for five weeks. Um, turned up the PCA London Biggest qualifier of the year, 600 competitors. Didn't tell anyone, just turned up. Few boys upset when I walked in reception because I kept them on the radar. Yeah. And, uh, like, Fuck, I didn't know he was going. Yeah, <laughs> they were like, going. you kept that quiet. They were like, boom, man. And um, yeah, just won my class, won the overall. And then a week later, then came second in the Britain mm. on, a, on a 10, 11 week prep. So yeah, it was the last time I competed in 2021. Quite, that's quite an achievement, to be fair. And obviously, you have the nickname, the Welsh shredder and uh, that's quite a cool nickname obviously i can sort of imagine where that comes from yeah but where was the where did that actually originate from um i was just I, somebody caught somebody commented it on a on a post a couple of years back but i think obviously it goes back to like conditioning that i bring same as my my team granite like i could like bring that granite hard conditioning mm. and you just don't see it anymore you don't i was in shows last year and it's just the industry has shifted so much you know, everyone has got that mindset where they want to get from A to B as quick and easy as possible. You know, can I take, you know, a fat burner instead of doing more cardio? Can I take more drugs to get leaner or get bigger? And I've just got that real, like, old school work ethic where I will absolutely suffer more than anyone. And I don't care what anyone says. I know when I'm in that, I'll go to dark places where a lot of people want. I've seen me in prep in agony with hunger pains for weeks on end. And I can't, I can't eat anything. I can't because I've got to make weight. When I was making weight as a heavyweight, you've got that weight cap, you know. So if I was, start, you know, I've, I've seen me go to bed at 11 o'clock, waking up at midnight, an hour later, literally in agony with hunger pains, drinking water throughout the night to try and fill my stomach. Mm. Just couldn't, like, some days struggling to walk. You know, when you're 105 kilos and you're, like, a couple of percent body fat, where it's, it's everything hurts, like, everything. It's just, it really, really does suck. Yeah. You know, when you kind of carry that kind of tissue around. And you just don't, you know, eat like 80, 70, 80 kilo boys, you know, they should essentially get leaner because they're lighter. Mm. I mean, they don't know as much tissue. You know, they should be shredded. And when you see somebody who's a heavyweight and they're leaner than every single person in the show, it just goes to show like, you know, mm. and I think... So what's, what's that down to? That's not, you're saying that's... It's not taking the drugs and stuff like that. It's just the the old school way. Yeah, doing absolutely. the cardio. Yeah, you know, not eating. Yeah, I've never been a big advocate of drugs. I've never taken a lot of PEDs mm. ever. You know, I've always had good blood work. You know, even on cycle and things like that. Um, and absolutely, it it literally sucks until you've actually gone through that process. There's nothing worse because you're restricting your body of one thing it needs to survive is food. Mm. So when you're going through all day, every day, your body's telling you, eat this, eat that, eat this, you're craving, you know, it's you've got no energy levels, you've got no libido, you just can't be bothered. It's just like, I've been, I don't think I've enjoyed any prep I've ever done, mm. except last year, uh, 2021. Every other one, to me, is like, right, I'm going to start this prep, and my mindset is, right, I've got a task now, i got 16 weeks, this is my, my job, you know, and then it's, I'm like, 10 weeks in, life sucks. I'm like, I just don't want to do this. Mm. But I'm so invested. I'm so far in. Like, I would never quit. You know, I'm just thinking, why can't I just drop a dumbbell on my foot and just be done with it? Yeah. Because, you know, you're not getting paid to do it when you're an amateur. You know, so... so I, why then? Why didn't you just get in shape to show yourself you can do it? 
why do you do it for the competition? What's the you know why, why you compete? What, what, you know what better way to stand on stage you know and and put your physique against other physiques you know mm. and I I've never I'm not the most overconfidently person you know I always go into a show I always go into prep and I'm always like Jesus Christ he looks good he looks good and it's only until you actually stand next to another human on stage you think wow do you mean I literally I can remember the British in that 2021 I looked down the corridor and I just seen this guy who was massive and I was just like oh my god he's in my class because I'm class one with all the tall guys yeah I was like he's definitely class one and literally smoked him on stage you know so when so you do you ever get you get do you doubt yourself then do you all know the time what? I always wonder what really? it's like do yeah. you know on show day behind like behind the scenes when you're all I'm assuming you're all like yeah. bringing each other up what's it like that then because like, do you feel like oh fuck maybe he looks better than me yeah because I think we're all we're all guilty of self-sabotage do you mean I don't I I've never looked in the mirror and thought, oh my God, you look amazing. Do you mean, I think mm. we'll always see flaws. We'll, you're always going to move on to the next things. Even if I, you know, squatted 300 kilos, I'll want 310. Do you mean, it's, that, it's, like, it's like that in everything in life. Do you mean you always want to move the goalposts? And I think bodybuilding is psychological. It is, you know, you mm. just, you never, we've all got body dysmorphia at some some point, like, do you mean? Yeah. So I think, yeah, definitely backstage is, you're looking around and they're looking at you and especially when you're getting tanned up, you're all bollock naked. You know, and it's like, yeah, even in the qualifier before the British, there was another guy and I'd seen him on Instagram and he gets lean. And even when we were getting tanned, I was thinking, fucking hell, there he is. Like, you know, and then when I when you see this, the the pics on stage, ne me next to him, it's just no no comparison. Like, mm. So I think that always made me a kind of dangerous or as a bodybuilder because I always always wanted better i never ever like got ahead of myself i never thought you know what well, yeah like even with my legs now people just they got a life of their own people are like oh my god your legs and it's like they're my legs i look at them every fucking day yeah i mean they, they don't look all that to me you know i think that's what as humans we're guilty of like yeah we're always trying to compare ourselves to other people as well and obviously bodybuilding yeah. is a and, and, and to be honest that. though i've never ever envied anyone in my life i've never really looked at bodybuilders for motivation at all, I, I I don't follow a lot of pro bodybuilders. Like I I did, you no, know, I did love Philly Flex, but apart from that, people would like be messing me. Oh, do you know this guy? Do you know that? I was like, I'm gonna clue even on the scene now. Really, mm. I mean, for me, it was always I I want to be a better version of me. You know, if I beat my last out in my last physique, you know, when I first won the Mister Wales in 2012, which I never thought I was going to, I won my class and I was I was going for India and I was like, well, I'm off. And they were like, no, you got you've got to stay. You, you know, you you're going to the, you're in the overall. I was like, I can win the overall. I know guys who've won Mr. Wales, and no fucking chance. Like, no, you've got to win. And I ended up winning. Nice. Um and then people, a lot of people wrote me off and said, Oh, you know, was you gifted it and all the other all the other bullshit you see on social media. So I thought, you know what? I came back the following year, eleven pound heavier, even leaner, even bigger, won my class, won the overall again, and then I done it again the third year. Only person ever to do it three times on a bounce, and that's mm -hmm. where they awarded me then the Paul Grant. Memorial Shield for life. Paul Grant, people don't know, was in Pampan Iron with Alan Schwarzenegger. So I've got that shield. So That's that was, iconic. That yeah, that was, yeah. Uh, that was really, really good. It's like a big yeah. Spartan shield. And on the back, you've got all ex-pro bodybuilders. Um, so yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, it's it's a, it's a sport. I know it's it's it's, it's mad, and you you touched uh, on your your coaching service there, Team Granite. But it seems to me that it's more than just the coaching service to you. It seems that it's a bit of a mindset for you. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned it's that ability to go into the dark places and you know the trenches and, and dig. Where does that come from? Then is it internal or is it something that's happened to you in your life that's given you the ability to just dial in into those dark places and just try I just to think succeed? yeah, I just think I've got to just got that work ethic. At the end of the day, if you're going to do something, do it. 100 percent mm. like why would you do and it's not the sport where you know you're kicking a ball in the back of the net if you're a bodybuilder you know you you think right for the next 16 weeks now i've literally got to you know shut myself off you can't go anywhere you can't go on holidays you can't really do much it is a very selfish sport so if you're going to do it do it 100 mm. percent i would never ever cheat on my diet i would never like cut corners because i i know for a fact if i ever stood on stage and I got beat because I got beat by the better person. Not always the case, because there are some decisions yeah. that should have gone that my guy, way. That, that guy didn't cheat on that one meal. Do you know what I mean? He <laughs> yeah. was a little bit better than you, even if it was yeah. just one meal he didn't yeah, cheat. Yeah, but then it's, you know, there are a lot of politics in bodybuilding as well. Do you mean there's, mm. you know, there's a lot of shows I should have won? I should have absolutely won the world championships. Do you mean when you look back at the pictures, you know the guys delts are full of synthol. Do you mean it's absolutely? If you can see them in the pictures, the judges can see them. You know mm. so. There are decisions that never went my way. Um, 
But I think just that work ethic in bodybuilding, you've got to have it. And now it's become a participation sport. Everyone wants to do it because everyone wants to say, I'm a, I'm a bikini athlete, I'm a bodybuilder. But then when you go to these shows and you see the physiques, they're not, you know, every single person, especially a guy, should be conditioned. Mm. The number one thing. If you're not conditioned on stage, then, you know, you might not have you know, as much muscle mass as the guy next to you, but every single person should be absolutely conditioned because that is... You know, part and parcel of bodybuilding. Yeah. And when you see these boys on stage, soft and soft glutes, and and that's what it's become. It's become a participation sport. It's so like mainstream now. Why do you think that is, though? I just think everyone's validity in everything in life now. You look at Instagram. Everyone wants the likes. Everyone wants the clicks. You know, a girl can put a picture of a meal up, and she'll get hundred likes. And she can put a picture of her in lingerie, and she'll get five thousand likes. Whatever. Do you mean it's Fact. everyone wants? validation mm. everyone wants you know that you know look at me and i think they're doing it for the wrong reasons like nobody cares about your story you're on stage to be judged do you mean it's a competition yeah. mm. i'm sorry if you want to go on stage and make numbers up and just stand there you know for your family then fair enough but for me it's absolutely a competition i think people are coming away from that they, they seem to forget like do you mean you know it is a comp you know yeah. and, and it is a participation sport now i'm not saying that every, you know there are incredible bodybuilders in the uk but it's it is very saturated now with people just going through the mill like and nobody wants to do any hard work anymore. And you can see it in the physiques. You can see it. Mm. I think that's just the attitude that we have now in everything, I think. Same as like, you know, how people carry themselves. Social media maybe yeah. has done something to that. People just want to post a picture, they want to tell people, Oh look, I did a comp. I wonder how many people actually who just do it, they do one comp just to say they've done one and then yeah. they leave it. Yeah. I or wonder if there's a lot of people now that don't do it for as long as they used to because they're not as committed to the, yeah. the competition. They and just not just wanna... that, because <laughs> it sucks because when you actually follow something through 100%, it affects everything in your life, your energy levels, your day-to-day -day life. I mean, everything. It is not nice being, you know, under 10% body fat for weeks, months on end. Mm. Like 2018... I dieted 287 days of the year. I started in January and I literally finished in November. Nice. I had 16 <laughs> days off that year and I was shredded like that whole year. Mm. And by like the world championships in November, my, yeah, I was just like, you know, it's like, right, we're, we're going to pull all the stops out over the two weeks leading into the worlds. And we were like, right, we're going to go zero fat, zero carbs. And like, I was doing. So zero fat, so no energy source whatsoever, no. just protein. So all I was on was tuna every meal. <laughs> I went and have gills. That's worse know. than Thor Burn, isn't it? Right. It's... So I was on tuna, ev tuna and peas every meal. Garden um, peas. <laughs> garden peas. Um, I, know what I, want to. <laughs> I was on tuna and peas every meal, and like three days in, I was just like, nothing's working here. My body's like obviously fighting back. And uh, next minute, like seven pound down. Then it'd be like three pound, two pound, one pound. I dropped thirty four pound in ten days. Okay, from the British insane. to the Worlds, and I rocked up to the Worlds, and they were like, fucking hell, what have you fucking done in two weeks? Because yeah, you look completely different. And I was absolutely peeled. But even going into the the NABA Mr. Wales that year, I was ill six weeks out from the show. No ideal. So the only thing I could... Uh, I think I, I think I always push too hard, and I think that's kind of been my crux sometimes, because I push too hard. I think sometimes it's detrimental, because I will kill myself practically for a qualifier, mm. and then if I got the British then, like two, three weeks later, it's kind of hard to peak. But um, I was ill going into the Naba Wales in 2018, didn't tell anyone, and um, I was eating tuna and onions, right? Oof. So when, That's a nice combination, when you were, when especially you were, for your breath. <laughs> yeah, when he was frying the onions, it just reminded me of like hot dogs in a fair. Oh. So I was just lapping well, these like onions. onions. Yeah, just lapping these onions up. But uh, I got into the Naba Wales, one first time I've ever entered Naba, won my class, won the overall. And then somebody messaged me there from up north and said, Oh, we've heard the Welsh shredder get that. The, the reason you get lean is because of tuna and onions. I was like, no, mate, I was on tuna and onions because I, I had a stomach virus. I don't think I could eat. Yeah. You know, there's loads of boys up here now prepping on tuna and onions. <laughs> to inspire in, inspire in new generations. Yeah. Oh, so funny. everyone's buzzing up north. Yeah, how do you how do you embrace the suck then, Neil? Because it seems that you, you have got such a hardcore mentality and it's very old school and just 
no room for any excuses for anything at all. Yeah. You know, and that, like you said, nowadays, a lot of people tend to break the excuses out when it gets hard. Yeah. You know, they bring up their stories, they bring up why they couldn't do this. Instead of looking for ways to do it, they look for ways to not do it. Yeah. And, and you, you know, excuse it. Yeah. And you, 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 your mind will, will always crack before your body will. And mm. I think if you've got that kind of killer mindset to be able to push through barriers, you, you can take your body anywhere. Mm. And, I've, and I know, like, just from being deep in prep and, um, I've just got that kind of mindset that I don't think you can even, it's either in you or it's not. Some people are, are mentally weaker than others. Um, and yeah, like I said, yeah, I've never enjoyed most of my preps. I was literally sat there and I'm like, like a corpse, like even like from on peak week, the week before the show, like I've seen like the boys in the gym on a Thursday, my last session, I've walked into the show on a Sunday, three days later and they're like, oh my God, what the fucking hell have you done? Mm. Like my eyes are sunk into my skull. Like I'm so conditioned and dry when I dry out for the show. It's like somebody's just literally spray tan the skull. I'm, like you could, in some of my, my shots with Kevin Orton, Kevin Orton shot me in 2014. He shot the iconic black and white photos of Dorian Yates. Oh, whoa. Yeah, he was a BSN photographer and he shot me one of the, some of the best shots he's ever done of me. And if you look at these shots, the professional ones, they've gone, they've done the rounds. You can actually see my, my, my cheekbones, my skull. I'm that. There's just skin on my face. That's it. No fat, just skin. No, yeah, you can actually see like my eye sockets. That's insane. <laughs> what's the what's the the? I mean, we can get on to some health complications you had in your life, but just regards to stuff like that. And you said sometimes you push too far. Do you sometimes worry that you're going to end up just keeling over because of no, because I of think, some preps that you've taken really far? Yeah, I think to, on a flip side, which I'll say to you now, I think it saved my life. Um, but no, obviously that's a snapshot. You cannot, you know. You, you, you're really dry and you're really like sort of pushing it like the last two weeks going into a show and like obviously on, yeah. on show day you could never maintain that kind of body fat mm. um but you know you are essentially dying your body doesn't want to be that lean it's always fighting against you always mm. you know so it's not sustainable to, to be that lean but you know when you're on stage you just have to peak perfectly for that one day and that's where everything tapers down from 20 weeks right down the show day yeah yeah, speaking of, of health complications, obviously you had a challenging year last year. Um, you know, you you put you put this on Instagram and it's I've seen it and I I commend you for getting through that. Um, so March the eighth last year, and your surgery was on the ninth, I believe, yep. last year. Yeah. March the eighth last year, you were literally told by a doctor, get your affairs in order. What was going through your mind when they when they when they said that to you? Because I I am one person who is, I wouldn't say scared of death, but I'm a bit like worried by yeah. it because that, maybe because I haven't achieved what I want yet. Um, so to be told that would really send shivers down my spine. So yeah. what went through your head when, when they said that? I, I'm scared of death. I really am. Do you mm. mean? And it's, you know, it's different like somebody dying or it's, and, and it's different as somebody actually telling you you're going to die. You've got time then to actually take that in. You know that. You know, yeah, a couple you of know, you could exactly. Be, could be so it, I, it all started me, you know, I run my blood work privately a couple of times a year. I've always got good blood work. So I run my blood work at the end of January. Um, and one of your markers on your blood work is your CRP marker, which is a C reactive protein marker. That's the inflammation markers of your blood. So if you've got any inflammation, if you've got a, like, you know, if you're ill, it will always show up on that marker. Mine was minus five, which is amazing what it should be. Yeah. So that was brilliant. Following week, went to the dentist, routine checkup with the hygienist, cleaning my teeth, going under my gum line, you know, getting the plaque from under the teeth, you know, and as you do, you spit it in the sink somehow oral bacteria in the blood in my mouth got into my bloodstream. So the first place it'll go is at any kind of leaflet. So I went straight down, latched onto my valve and ate my valve away. So I just woke up on a Sunday morning, just shivering uncontrollably. Mm. I don't know if you've seen the video on Instagram. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, shivering uncontrollably, thinking I was cold, get in bed under three blankets, thought I had a fever, 40 degree temperature, um, heart rate 115 beats, Went over to A and E, fifteen hour wait, stuff that. Go back home, and then all that week, then back and forth the GP. So when the GP he checked me over urine, things like that, you're fine. Sent me for bloods. The Wednesday I went for bloods in the hospital. Actually, had an attack when they were taking the bloods. I'm like shivering. Mm. Just sent me packing. Bloods came back. Folic acid deficiency. Nothing else, which is quite common in males. And then the Friday, it came to head. I was having them again. So luckily, Dr. Patel, thank God, um, I rang the surgery at six o'clock and he's like, the surgery's closed, but I'll wait here for you. So if you come here, knock on the door and I've got a letter for you to take it over to the hospital. So I drove, 
went there, got the letter. He said, take us to the hospital. They're waiting for you. So in the hospital, they saw me about one o'clock in the morning. They thought it was meningitis. So they were doing all the tests, chest scan, head scan, bloods, everything. Um, then he's like, right, get on the bed. We're going to do a lumbar punch in the spine. So I was like curled in a fetal position and uh, you could see like the doctor was like shitting herself because she was feeling my back. And I got very thick spinal erectors. She was like trying to feel my vertebrae. I was like, please don't hit my spine. Like to be there. So in she went, prodding, pushing, pulls it out. She's like, oh, I can't get any fluid. I have to go in again further up. I was like, oh, right. She goes in again, second time, can't get any fluid, pulls out. She goes, right, I'm going to go third time. If I can't get it, I'm going to call the anesthetist. She got on the third attempt, mm. came back, fluid was clear. And then literally sent me home with paracetamol. So I went home. Radiant. Yeah, got home, literally sat on the sofa. Phone goes, can you come back? We found back to you in your blood. So I went straight back to the hospital and that's when I went downhill. And I was in intensive care. They tried putting the C mat mask on me, um, which they were putting on like a lot of COVID sufferers, which is basically when you breathe in, it blows oxygen into your lungs. It doesn't work as effectively, does it? <clears throat> it was making me breathe out of my own rhythm. Because yeah. every time I was like, because I was breathing so fast because I was, you know, obviously my O2 stats were like 80%. So I was on like four litres of oxygen. Um, it was making me breathe out of rhythm. <clears throat> so I had them take the mask off. They put me on a normal mask and then they blue lighted me over then to Morrison Hospital. Four o'clock in the morning, um, I was on morphine, fentanyl. I was just wired up, to, like, I had everything. And then basically, they came and done a mobile echocardiogram, which is a scan on your heart, like an ultrasound, and they could see a mass on my valve. And then next minute, I got seven doctors that bought my bed. And uh, this is exactly what he said to me. He's like, we don't know you're alive. He's like, you've been in acute heart failure for two weeks. He's like, we don't know you're alive. He's like, if it had been any of us, we'd be dead. Yeah. He's like, but you're so physically fit and you're so physically strong. He's like, that's that's what's that's how you're you. Mm -hmm. He's like, uh, we've got you on so much diuretics because your heart is offloading water. If we carry on, you'll have kidney failure. He's like, normally we'd give you antibiotics for two weeks and then we'd operate. But he said, you won't be here in two weeks. He said, we've got 24 hours. If we don't do something in the next 24 hours, you're not going to see the next 24 hours. And he said, your valves are obliterated. And he's like, personally, you're in, you're in a bad way. I'd get you the fares in order. So you can imagine, I'm, you know, Fucking you're in hell, intensive man, care. Yeah. You're so you're literally own. saying the chances of us pulling, yeah, yeah, pulling, yeah. pulling you through this is uh, slim tonight. Yeah, so I just, oh, yeah. I didn't know what to do. So I just wrote my will on my phone, wrote my will on my phone, uh, made a video for my daughter, because my daughter's in private boarding school in Dover, mm. made a video for her. And then I had to get my father on FaceTime and my sister. And like, you could see my father was like trying to hold it together. My sister was like breaking down. I'm like, look, they told me to get my face in order. I don't know if I'm going to survive the surgery. And uh, I'm going down tomorrow morning. And then eight o'clock Wednesday morning, they come and got me. And it's like, they say, you know, your life flashes before your eyes. It really don't. You're just a victim of your surroundings. They were just wheeling me down in the bed. And I'm thinking, you know, right, here we go. Like, and they pushed me through the doors and you could see like the theatre. And like they're all around you and they shift me onto another bed and uh Sammy was there, a great friend of mine, a girl who works in cardiac. Um, and she was like there, she's like, I'll be there, I'll hold your hand when they when they put you out. I was like, Thank you. And they put the uh, anest they put the anesthetic in me, and I was like, Here we go, am I gonna wake up? So you thought this <clears throat> is potentially the last bit of life. That yeah, and you, you know, you're not really scared. You know, obviously I was drugged up, I was on morphine, I was on fentanyl, you know, but I knew exactly what was going on. And uh yeah, six hour operation. So they sawed my sternum open, cracked my chest open, collapsed my lungs, moved my lungs out of the way, filled the heart to potassium, stopped the heart for 45 minutes, put me on a bypass machine, cut the top of the heart, looked down, cut the valve out, took the valve out, then microsurgery the £14,000 carbon fibre valve in, and then wired me closer like a shoeless. Yeah. So they, that was 8 o'clock Wednesday morning, and then they brought me round Thursday afternoon. So what was so two questions I want to ask you. What was the first thought in your head when they told you about you know the possibility of you being dead, um, and then what was the first thought in your head after you regained consciousness on the Thursday afternoon? Yeah, like when they first told me, like for somebody who, who takes pride in their health and like you know you see yourself as this like you know, you know sort of like not superhuman, but I've always excelled at everything I've done. I've always been strong, powerful. I mean, I've always excelled in the gym, and it's like, mm. how did this happen to me? Like, we didn't even think it was the dentist. I'm like, how has this happened? I was my... You find that. People who smoke for 60 years, and they're absolutely yeah. fine. Um, and then as somebody will go through life, not avoiding risk, but the healthy as, as can be. Your, yeah. As you said, your bloods were, like, the best they can be. Yeah. 
you know why on earth did that happen because i actually had a question for you 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 talk about just spreading positivity and being good to people and i'm thinking why does something like that happen as such a, a good person yeah. when there are criminals and villains out there escaping any sort of consequence like why do you yeah, think you about that, that at all like why me yeah but i think you know you know i'm still you you know and i'm probably in the best shape healthiest i've ever been you know and i didn't come to hospital with a goal to you know get back in you know to the size i am and to the you know doing what i'm doing just my body did that they've never seen anyone recover like me either you know i was in hospital for nearly two and a half months you know i had a pick line in my bicep there and it basically, it's like a catheter. So it's a pick line, 40 inches into my bicep, into my artery, right up into my heart. And they were putting antibiotics in there every four hours, 24 hours a day for two and a half months. So six in the morning, 10 in the morning, Oof. two in the afternoon, six in the evening, 10 at night, round the clock. They were putting antibiotics in there. And, um, you know, like post-surgery, lost 20 kilos, open heart surgery, um, very emotional when they brought me round. I can remember them bringing me round. I still had the tube in my mouth and I was trying to pull the tube out. And it's something trivial, but not to me. Growing up, one of my favourite films is Karate Kid. Mm. And Karate Kid 2, there's a, a song in there by Peter Sativa called Gloria Love. Might have heard it, right? And uh, it's one of my favourite songs. And when they brought me round, it was playing on the radio. Oh, wow. Right? It was playing on the radio. But the, and they brought me a cup of tea then about five minutes later. And when the nurse walked over and she turned the TV on, and Cratty Kid was on. So the song was playing on yeah. the radio and, and the film came on the TV and I'll never, and even, I even took a photo of it. I'll never forget that. Yeah. You know, and um, I was emotional, crying. Um, I'm quite an emotional person anyway. I wear my heart on my sleeve, but I was very emotional. I was like, first thing I thought, I'm alive. It's the first thing I thought. Mm. You know, but it was a massive struggle then. Like, you know, being in hospital for two and a half months, learning how to walk again. Um, you know, I couldn't walk from year to year without two litres of oxygen, like shuffling, you know, obviously you're sawn open, just in recovery intensive care as well, lots of things went on, I was in agony throughout the night, I couldn't lay in a bed, I couldn't lay back, so the only place I was comfortable was sitting in a chair, so I was sitting upright for like 18, 19 hours a day, then I was hallucinating, talking to myself, just weird things, like they pulled the curtain around the bed for me to go to the toilet, and I was like, you know, nurse, 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 can you pull the curtain back, just like anxiety, which mm. I don't suffer from. Just loads of things, you know. I had wires going into my midsection and they cut them and pulled them out. And I, unbeknown to me, the wires were was, was stitched into my heart lining. So they cut them and they had to pull them through my midsection, literally the worst, a scream of the water down, worst yeah. pain I've ever felt in my entire life. You know, things like that and just learn how to, you know, get them out to walk again. And obviously I'd, I'd take my auction off then. I was taking my auction off. And I was like walking to the toilet, coming back, breathing, putting my oxygen back on. Then I'm walking to the corridor. Then I'm walking to the main corridor. Then I'm walking to the Costa mm. coffee shop. And then I'm walking, then I'm doing the perimeter of the hospital then. So every day I was getting a little bit, getting your steps you know, in. I was just filming my people who yeah. followed me. I was filming my shit slippers because I was in slippers. I was walking to the hospital. And then I thought, right, I'm going to walk these flight of stairs with you. And I can remember walked up one flight of stairs. My heart, it was 148 beats. Whoa. And something you take for granted, just breathing, you know, like gasping for air, trying to get the air in, like rushing back to the ward then, not rushing, but walking back, putting my oxygen on. It was horrendous, it really was. But I mean, just, we were going to sit there for two and a half months and just see my my recovery through. Yeah. You know? what's, what's the what's the biggest lesson then you've learned from that, like that whole experience? Because you know, being on the brink of death, I'd imagine, probably taught you something about yourself that you didn't know. Yeah, it's, I think it's definitely it's definitely taught me, like, you know, the way I look at life now. You know, things you take for granted and just, like, a different outlook on life mm. completely. And this is, like, you know, it just radiates more into my coaching as well. Like, and I do really, you know, anyone, you know, can be a coach. I mean, just because you're a good bodybuilder doesn't make you a good coach. Just because you're an IFBB pro doesn't make you a pro coach. Yeah. You've got to be a specific type of person. You've got to have empathy. You've got to care. Do you know I mean? And it's like... You know, this is why I run blood work and this is why I put so much free information out. If I you know if I can't give some something back for free for all the years I've done what I've done, then you know, what use am I like? I mean, mm. I think we're in an industry where everyone is so like, you know, I can't tell you this because you might implement that and you might use it and you might beat me on stage. And, you know, they say knowledge is power, but it's not. It's applied, applied knowledge. knowledge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you can know all the knowledge in the world, but if yeah. you can't apply it, it means nothing. And this is why... Blows my mind when you look at 
PTs that are not in shape as well. How can you? I agree. How can you motivate a client if you're not in shape yourself? Mm. I really don't get that. I re- I just really don't mm. be a product of your own environment. But definitely that experience give me a different outlook on life, and I, and it just goes to show. And it, it blows my mind how people idly go through life just neglecting the one thing that carries them through life. Because I can guarantee you now, if you pay for it now, either pay for it now or pay for it later. Because at some point, something will happen to every single person. They say every person goes to one kind of major surgery in their life. You know, and I think the one thing that carries you through life, your physique, you wouldn't run your car and no fucking oil would do. No. You know? No. You know, look after your physique and it will absolutely look after you. And it saved my life. They told mm. me that. And I Probably think if that it, happened to one of us now, we, we, would, we, we wouldn't have had the same muscle because obviously your, your cardio would have been good as well. Yeah, you know, and, you know, training is a form of stress. Competing is a form of stress. Me getting down to them insane body fat levels, mm. my body's used to trauma. Mm. So ultimately, do you mean it? That's what held me on for them two weeks. I'm doing like 80 kilo skull crushes in the gym, more than I'm fatigued and I'm unbeknown. I'm an heart failure, you know? So. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy. Like, and like this is why I do a lot of blood consultations, a lot of blood work. And like this generation of people, these boys, bodybuilders, people that just in general, like 10, 15 years on the line, it's going to be bad because like the cholesterol and the blood work I look at is just insane. Absolutely insane. Yeah. What's the what's the biggest alarm sign then of someone with deteriorating um, sort of health then? Because I'm, I'm obviously, we're, we're obviously 21 years, years of age each. Um, and we've seen this is the, the physical prime, you know, 21 to maybe 30 is the is the physical prime. So what can we do then to sort of look out for signs of deterioration? I think, you know, at 21, you're not really going to have any of you. But, you know, it doesn't mean you can't still look after, you know, your your physique and your health. Look at the world we live in now, like with COVID and all this. It's going to absolutely come back around again. So mm. why not be in the fittest, healthiest version to tackle that, mm. you know? Or if anything, like, life throws at you because... It is going to throw a curveball at you. I went to the dentist and he lost my fucking life. Do you mean yeah. so? As simple as that. So but, no dentist trips for any of us anymore. Yeah, I, but I'm I'm more appreciative of stuff like this now. I mean, I've never seen that in my family at all, really. But all of a sudden, my father's got heart problems and he needs to sort his life out, otherwise he'll have a stroke and die. And then a couple of years ago, my mother found a massive tumor in the back of her head. Not yeah. cancer, but all out of nowhere, somebody with decent health wobbling a bit went to the doctor. There's a lump that big in the back of her head. Yeah. Like, all of a sudden, you know, anything can go wrong. And I, I do appreciate that now. That I can't just, I can't take everything for granted. No, and I think we do. And I think, you know, until you're in a position like I was, it really, really, like, you know, it really fucking puts things in perspective. Like, you think, Jesus Christ, you know, imagine somebody, you know, I've got cancer in the family. I've got a, I've got a family member now dying of brain cancer. But, you know, people who smoke and then they get cancer and I bet the first thing you think of, Jesus Christ, I wish I never smoked. Yeah. You know, I know it's hard to give up, but just you can't idly go through life, you know, just thinking that, you know, you're always going to have your health. You've got to look after it. You have. And I, I reap what I sow. What I do every single day is literally what saved my life and mm. it made me who I am. Do you mean? And like not, never been a big drinker, never smoked, never not abused drugs. And I think that's the culture we're in now. Even like you guys saying you're 21. There's boys in their 20s now who I see their blood work and their cholesterol markers are absolutely fucked. Yeah. Literally, at 21. What are you going to be like, you know, all these boys chasing a pl- plastic trophy? What are you going to be like 20 years on the line when you've got kids and, you know, you got, mm. and your goals are different? You know, you've, you can't just idly think, oh, I'm young and you know, I'm bulletproof. Yeah, and all of a sudden you're is, 40, The damage you're like, is being you've, done you've now done and it'll already. rear itself. Yeah. It's, it's, it's rear his head like in 10, 15 years. And especially now with advances we got in supplementation, you know, we know how to read blood work, you know, the pressure on the world as well, GPs, the pressure on GPs, you know, and, you know, they just want you out of that room as quick as possible. You're just yeah. a number to them. You'll never get a GP giving you health and diet advice. It's like, they you don't know, give lifestyle advice. They just give you yeah. pills. This is the thing. You know, and, Take this, take that at this yeah. time. And there's loads of, and there's loads of things I could say in that regard. I had, I had a girl come on board my team last year, Jade, shout out to Jade, and she had polycystic ovary syndrome and she had ovarian cysts all her life. Mm. Bursting, growing, bursting, growing. So she came to me. She was on she was she was told to take certain supplements that, that made no sense, like maca root and other things. Maca root increases blood flow. Why would you uh, why would you be on that if you've got tumors? Mm. So when you're gonna feed the tumor. Um so we put her, I put her on a really good diet. 
I put her on um, Kakumi 95, which is amazing for tumours. It's turmeric, basically. Isn't it? Yeah, but the, what people don't realise is Kakumi is the most active ingredient in turmeric. It's like the concentrated good yeah, stuff. Yeah, so you can take turmeric and it's going to do nothing for you. If you, you take a cumin 95, it's different because it's 95% curcuminoids. And not just that, your body has, it can't absorb curcumin. So this is why if you ever see like a, a patented curcumin 95, it's always got biopreem, which is black pepper, to increase the absorption for you to uptake it. Mm. You know, the data on curcumin like shrinks tumours, shrinks cancer cells. So I put it on that. I put it on in a Satol as well, like B6. Um, 12 weeks later, gone for life. Dropped, dropped a b- a I was down. told this just while we're on like some fancy stuff that me and Martha don't understand. I was told actually a guy uh, to mentioned you in in kicks and he said you're literally like a walking encyclopedia when it comes to supplementation yeah. and everything. Yeah. You know, um, do do you agree with that? Do you feel like you? Yeah, you I, know I don't know. I shit? don't know. If, then obviously, I think that's I always research and there's always new data coming out. I was surrounded by really good guys in my past. Mark Robinson, my ex coach. Pharmacologist, one of the most intelligent guys I've ever met in my life. And just, you know, I thrive information as a person. And, that, and that's in everything. If I was going to go buy a car, I would know everything about that car before I bought it. Yeah. If I watch a film and it's a true story, I'll go and if somebody asks me a question and I don't know the answer, no matter what it is, I'll have to go and find out. Mm. And I just take it in. But, you know, as a bodybuilder and supplementation, you walk the walk as well. Do you mean like I yeah. take it to see, right, what can this do for me? What can this ingredient profile do? And yeah, I, I live and breathe it, breathe it. You know, so supplementation, you know, and nutrition, I'm always kind of like, researching yeah do you I, think that there's a there's an issue these days with because i've looked at what you, what you need to do to get sort of like level three pt and nutrition coaching and stuff like that it, it's anyone can do it anyone do you feel like there's a problem now where the people who are supposed to be the coaches and the mentors in this industry they don't know what they're talking about they don't know what they're really giving you yeah and there's a lot of misinformation out there Every, again, a saturation everyone is you can see it in like in the, in the fitness industry everyone's you know, putting subtitles on their videos, everyone's doing videos, everyone's doing reels, and you know, it's <laughs> everyone's like, you know, look at my look at me over here, I look at this shiny ball. Like, I mean, everyone's like, you know, everyone's trying to reinvent the wheel. It's like people are doing a bicep curl and calling it a bilateral curl. Do you mean come on, like, just mm. it's crazy. Like, and I, I like, and this is why you see different physiques. I go in the gym and I the form I see in the gym, the way boys are training now with cuffs and all this cuff Behind work. Yeah, D handles and I can't even do a bent over row and I just think you're not gonna build a back doing fifteen kilo D handle pulls. You ain't. <laughs> you know, it's it's madness, man. Boys doing cuffed chest flies and can't bench under kilos. It's like I'm not saying they don't they don't work, but you know, stick to the basics because the basics work. Look at all the thousands of physiques have been built over the last twenty years. But now everything's, watching op- everything's optimal watching now. Watching Arnold's training back in the day, you n- I never saw him doing any of that fancy shit. Oh. He would just do incline bench press with chin ups. 80s. Crazy and crucifix yeah. for reasons. 80s, 90s, look at the physiques. And it's like everything now is optimal. This is the most optimal way to train chest, the most optimal way yeah. to train legs. Boys leg pressing 500 kilos but can't squat 140. It's madness, you know? It's And that's why we're seeing, you know, you even see in the Olympia lineup. Look at the, the physiques. When you look at Ronnie and, and Dorian and Phil Heath, the reins they had and the physiques they possessed, even them are going are, are going downhill. You know? Where do you think that comes from then? All this, all this sort of optimal training because it looks good. I think this has started. Is it from, because like, of TikTok. social media? Yeah, like, look at this reel. You need to do this yeah. bilateral, unilateral, yeah. one armed. So you got guys. Who, so you got guys who got big followings who probably didn't build their back doing D-handle rows, but then decide now they've got a big back, they can do a D-handle row. Yeah. They put a video up and boys think, oh, that's what he built his back. I'll do them. You know, it's, I was watching boys in the gym yesterday doing one arm panata rows on a on a machine. And, you know, the pad is there for a reason, to put your chest against it so you can isolate your body yeah. to, 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 you know, engage your lat. They've got their hand on the pad, they've got their hand on the row, and they literally, the whole body is doing this. And they've got five yeah. plates on it. And I'm thinking, you haven't even worked your lat at all. Yeah. And it's, it's Yeah, madness. you see that now. If you go into the gym now, if you look at, like, I've noticed this um, across different gyms you've been to. If you go into the gym now, you see, like, you know, maybe an 18, 19-year-old. They're doing, like, they're trying to, like, work on their lower lat fibres. And it's like, well, how can you work on your lower lat fibres if you I, don't We, have we a lat? talked about this. And when then the wiser, we're not in a position where we can start Absolutely educating not. young, like, more newer lifters. However, we did say an interesting thought that maybe in beginner 
beginners in the gym shouldn't have access to all the side bags. They should go and have like an old school, a bar, yeah. some plates, Spit and some dust. dumbbells, and then and then learn it. Yeah. Like Keith West was talking about that, but he started in a leisure centre. They had to fuck all there. So he had to improvise. He had to learn how to do it with less stuff. When you've got all the side bags here, Atlanta, you don't know what to do with it. You're doing all this stuff, yeah. watching somebody like Cooper doing it, but he's, he's massive. Yeah. Of course mm. he can do it. Yeah. Because he's got the fight. Like, I can't even do some of that stuff. I don't get the activation. Yeah, but if you went back 10 years when Cuba was probably starting out, was he doing it then? Probably not. No, he was doing bent exactly. on the rows then instead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, what builds your physique? What builds physiques? Mm. Do you mean hypertrophy? You're not going to get it from doing, you know, these... It's crazy. Like, it's too light. You're not causing enough hypertrophy. The machines have got a place, absolutely. You know, I don't I don't squat anymore. Like, you used to always be a monster squatter. But I got the size there. I can just maintain them and, and build them even more now by literally just direct, you know, overloading them directly more through more smoother movements, mm. less injury prone. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But somebody young coming up, you're not going to build a physique you ain't. When you go to the gym, how many people do you actually see that are actually really training fucking hard? Mm. You know? There's a difference. They're all on their phones. They've all got their tripods. Do you mean? There's, that's the culture we're in now. Yeah. yeah. So do you Everyone's disagree so with that true. culture then? Do you just do? You, do you think then you should just go into the gym and just like head well, down? What are you there for? Then? Anything, what, are you, what are you there for? I couldn't go in the gym and have, have an half-ass workout. I really couldn't. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I'm there. For, I'm there for one thing. I had to socialize. Mm. I'll sp- talk. I'll speak to somebody. But how can you? Because you know, once your blood pressure drops and you kind of lose the pump, you may just leave. Oh, it's probably worse than that. How grumpy do I get when I'm distracted and I'm yeah. having to talk to someone? I'm like, I'm losing it now. I, I, I need to get, I need to get And same it. as, you know, legs as well. People are like, oh my God, somebody said to me in Planet two weeks ago, young young boy, how many uh, pendulum squats are going to do to get a legs like that? I was like, are we fucking <laughs> going to get them like that? Oh, I do pendulum squat. <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. it's, and it, it, it hurts. Like, honest to God, I think my legs have stopped aching today from last Sunday. Literally Jeez. five, and I mean yeah. agonizing five day doms. Yeah. I did have a week off, but... Mm. leg training is brutal you can go in the gym and anyone go in the gym and move a weight for me to be you know but when you're controlling the weight under tempo with good form and good weight it's yeah. completely different legs like, is a different ball game I yeah, think I, I, get right there, I, then, I get nervous for leg days I, like, I, I, I'm different my mindset on leg days is different. Not, uh, I know, but you don't do any barbell squats anymore. You start off with no. that, does not you? Yeah, yeah. Because I'm on so a maybe plan, that, is that a problem then? Should you have barbell squats in there hundred percent? Or not really? You know, you got you can. You know, there's many ways to skin a cat. You can't. You know, I'm just gonna build legs doing barbell squats. Do you mean? But it's definitely gonna put more load on on the leg and the glute. Mm. You know, more than anything else. You know, so I I think leg press obviously. You know. You can isolate the quad a little bit more, but it puts a lot more stress in your hips, mm. especially your adductors and like your hip flexors and stuff. But I think with my mindset, I just went in the gym and I just destroyed my legs from any angle I could. Yeah. So if I, so if you were speaking out to someone who was a complete beginner, uh, really interested to learn in the gym, never never step foot in the gym, what would you advise them to do? What would be their, their workout split? What would be their eating? Like, what would you say for them? Because there's a lot of people now that just trying to start off in fitness. Start off with they do, they do a year in the gym, they get like a couple of mediocre pumps and then they jump, right, how can I get on, on the gear as quick as I can? Yeah, and that's the problem in it. I mean, it's peer pressure. Mm. There's boys in their 20s like literally destroying their lipids by going on gear in their 20s. You're in the prime of your fucking life. Mm. And that's that's the thing now. There's way, you know, it's great, but there's way too much information out there as well. There's way too many people talking openly about PEDs, not educating people on PEDs, the dangers of them, the you know the repercussions, what it's going to do to your physique in the long term, what it can do in the short term. You know, it's definitely not spoken about enough. Um, blood work is not spoken about enough. I think you know, as a beginner, stick to the basics because the basics work. Stick, you know, get strong. Stick to you know, squat, bench deadlift you know and then just polish off with other movements mm. like machines and that but if you want to get big and you want to get thick and you want to get strong one you've got to eat and this is one of the biggest problems you've got boys training six days a week killing it but they're not doing the most important part which is outside the gym i see boys who kill it six days a week in the gym and look exactly the same as they did two years ago so yeah. i mean it's like you know think of building a house like the bricks are the training but the cement is the food you know you've mm. got to eat you know and you, when you couple them two together and just get strong. If you're getting stronger, you mean, you, you know, I've never believed in log booking. I've never log, only once I've ever log booked. And I nearly had a pretty bad injury leg pressing. So, is that because you were chasing the numbers then? Yeah. Because a lot of people seem to do that. And they, like it's it's becoming popular now. You, and know? It, you, you can't, you can't infinitely 
keep on progressing. You just would never stop otherwise. And you, you mean it's impossible. Yeah. It's great to gauge what you've done the week before. I understand that. But as human beings, like with digits, like women obsessed with weighing scales and guys and things like that, you're going to look at a digit and you think, right, I don't know, last week I have got to beat it. You I'm know? guilty of that sometimes. Yeah. I and think. it's like, you know, and if you don't beat it, was you know, was this week a failure? Mm. But there's different ways you can measure progression, then, isn't there? Like you can you can measure it through through the load, through the repetitions, but you can also measure it through the tempo and the yeah. execution. Yeah. yeah, it's like in powerlifting. I did. I was on a powerlifting program for like two years. So if I if I if I squatted a, a single at a certain RP one week, and the next week it was lower weight, and it was the same RP, I'd be thinking, what happened there? But the technique was better, depth was better, and I had less knee pain. That's a win in my book, yeah. but at the same time, I'm looking at what I did last week and I'm seeing oh, I squatted five kilos less. Yeah, but it's still it's still a win, isn't it? You're still making progress. And I have when this you look at numbers, with with female clients, we're weighing. Women are just obsessed with weighing, and, and it's, yeah. it's the most inaccurate gauge to gauge progress ever. Mm. You know, because you don't do the same thing every single day, day in day out, and there's so many things that affect scale weight. You know, cortisol, stress, food in your bowels, hydration. You know, inflammation from training, so all these kind of things. Your your, your body fluctuates multiple times a day. And the scale will much fluctuate multiple times a day. If you trained legs yesterday, you're gonna hold weight. You know, an inflammation from training. So today, yeah, so if yeah. you're gonna use the scale, weigh every single day and take an average over the week. You know, so it's just not an accurate tool to gauge progress. Um, so I think again, yeah, there's lots of things that go into. Like I tell them, like, you know, a check-in is not just you getting on a scale, looking at a digit, and that dictates if you've had a good week or not. What's your energy levels like? What's your sleep like? What's your recovery like? Yeah. How do your clothes fit? Do you mean? What's your mood like? You know, have you stuck to the diet? There's so much that goes into a check-in rather than just getting on a scale and again, oh, I am lost no weight this week. It's mm. fucking failure. Yeah, that's 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 why a lot of people go wrong. They, they seem to, like, just think they're regressing because they're not... Uh, I've, I've, progress. Yeah, I've yeah. always been I've always thought right I mean I'm somebody who likes to think I'm a little bit like you I, I try and take in all the information and contextualize it so I'm thinking how did the people that I think look good how do they actually do it were they were they just be focusing on the details and this is the thing I find now with people my age uh, they focus on the details without any of the real understanding of the basics and I'm thinking I need to I need to have a look at the foundations first I need to go in the gym and do, you know, the barber rows and stuff like that. I don't feel like I should be logbooking every session. I don't want to be focusing on all the little bits. I just feel like it's too much. You have to I, think I like, I, I like, yeah, it's not about that. I just want to keep it as basic as possible. Not because I want it to be easy, because I just want to make sure that I'm I'm focusing on what really matters. And that's, that's the issue, I think, is so much distractions. Like, you know, you've got social media you've got people editing photos you've got doing reels you've got them filming themselves in the gym you've got distractions in the gym like when i was coming up and training you would have none of that you were just in the gym for an hour and a half and you would just you know you'd have amazing atmosphere there and you would just train i wouldn't even fucking log in what i was eating yeah you would just i mean your body will utilize whatever you've thrown in like do you mean if you've got pretty good genetics and you're, and you're actually utilizing you know, your body will utilize whatever food you put in it. Do you mean mm. you know, if it's a half ass diet? I mean, like, I didn't even think I even, you know, fucking hell, I didn't think I even ate properly when I first started competing. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people think they need more than, than they do. And I recently had uh, um, a friend ask me about supplements, and I was just I, obviously you have a lot of knowledge on supplements, and I wanted to know what's the line you should you should start thinking about supplements. You know, from like a beginner. To progress in at what point do you think right i need to start getting supplements you yeah know, the, there's the definitely ashwagandhas the creatines and whatnot. oh yeah you know you're 20 years of age and you take an ashwagandha to, to sleep like it's fucking madness mm. you know <laughs> I, I, I know i was when i was 20 but i actually you know i was who gives a shit like i mean i know yeah. there's more stress now and more like sort of we're open to more stress factors these days but definitely as a beginner would be creatine most studied supplement in the last 20 years 25 years Definitely creatine, definitely a good whey protein. Um, EEAs, you know, for recovery. That's pretty much it. You don't need all the million other things. And I, even though that's coming from me, what sponsored by Strom, and I do use all their range, and they, they are incredible. You know, and again, it's, it's different people. If you've got a lifestyle client, and then you've got a competitive client who's, who's under a lot more stress, mm. they're going to need the extra things then. Do you mean... You know, if they've got joint pain, you know, it's, it's everyone's different. I tailor the, the supplementation to whatever specific needs the person has. 
you know, females got to have a completely different kind of protocol to males. Yeah. You know, they, they, they're very different. They need digestive enzymes. They need pro, pro and prebiotics. They need iron every single day because they menstruate every month. So women are very different. They don't go to the toilet as regular as males, you know. Mm. So bowel health, digestive health has got to be key. You know, so it's, you could definitely have overkill with supplements. Absolutely. What about vitamin supplements? I would never take a multivitamin. It doesn't work, you know. Mm. Um, vitamins, there's some non-negotiables every day. Vitamin D3, because obviously we don't get a lot of sun. No. And if you run D3, you should absolutely run K2. You know, the one thing K2 does is anti-clotting. So it stops the blood from clotting. But vitamin D3 regulates calcium. And vitamin K2 transports calcium. So it's very good as well. If somebody's got the HDL, which is the high-density lipoprotein, which is the HDL cholesterol... If that's low, you're at risk of calcification in the arteries. So K2, because it transports calcium away from the arteries and away from the soft tissues into the bones, it's very, very good. You have to run it in synergy with D3. So D3, okay. K2. Mm. You wouldn't take like an omega-3 or... Yeah, absolutely. But again, I'm very anal when it comes to specific supplements. If I've got you know, something as critical as like magnesium, omega-3, krill... They have to be the highest quality because the one thing you're going to get out of omega-3 or a krill is the good fats, the EPA and the DHA fats. So that them fats is what p- protects, you know, heart health, cognitive function. You know, if you've got somebody who's got, you know, messed up cholesterol, they will absolutely help mm. bringing cholesterol markers back up. So if you're going to take that for them fats, it has to be a good quality because most of the oils out there are rancid, cheap oils, a pollu- uh, our seas are polluted, so got high mercury content. So I will only take a third party tested omega three and krill, only. So I know that they're certified. The purity is what it is, mm. and you know the EPA and the DHA. What is, they say is in that tablet is actually in that tablet. So krill, omega three, magnesium, um, always third party tested, and a lot of companies out there, majority of them are not. Because it's very yeah. expensive. So if I'm making an Omega-3 now, I'm going to pay your company to test my Omega-3s to make sure what I say is on the label is actually in the label. Yeah. So, you know, there's only three probably brands that I would take. Jaros, Solga, um, uh, Nordic Naturals. Again, they're probably one of the, the top three. But you're, pay, you're paying a lot more than you would for just Absolutely. A, you can go to Tesco and buy Omega 3 for fucking six quid. That's the sort you, of thing you I've go got buy, all Yeah, and you buy an Omega 3 like from Solga, it could be 27 quid. But you know then, do you mean you've got a multi million pound brand here, like a me- big American, and they're all American, funny enough. Jaros, Solga, uh, Swanson, and Nordic Naturals. They're the only four I would take when it comes to mm. tablets. They tested 30 supplements on Amazon a couple of weeks back. 20 of them had nothing in it. Zilch. So it's just a marketing So it's scam. a good business then? Because it's not regulated by the FDA. So they can put anything in there. Yeah. Do you mean? I don't check shit like this. I don't know why. You know, so when it comes to like, you know, when I'm looking at blood work and I'm doing blood consultations, I'm looking at markers because the one thing that's going to kill you is your cholesterol. That will absolutely kill you down the road. I've seen boys and I'm, and I'm pretty straight up and I'm like, listen, if you don't do something about this, you are absolutely going to get cardiovascular disease mm. because it's not so much now having high HDL and low LDL, obviously LDL being your bad cholesterol, your low density level yeah, protein. Yeah. It is obviously having them too, you know, you still need LDL for cognitive function, libido, but now it's your HDL to triglyceride ratio. And I know I'm probably the only guy in the UK that's actually converting HDL to triglyceride ratio because I know the blood lab don't do it. I know uh, Eval don't do it. I know many Czechs don't do it, who I work with quite a lot. Um, and you've got to convert it from nanomoles to mm-hmm. micrograms and deciliters. Right. So when you convert your HDL to triglyceride ratio, it gives you a marker number. So it falls in three markers. 0.5 to 1.9 is optimal, where everyone should sit. Two to three is slight insulin resistance, yeah. and anything over three is fully insulin resistant and heart disease. So if you're when you work out your HDL to triglyceride, if you're over three, you're gonna get heart disease. So you want one point nine. This yeah. is the th- yeah because I'm zero point five and one point nine. Yeah, yeah, and I've yeah. seen boys seven, Oof. six point two. No, I'm just wor- I'm just worried because my my father's father died of heart disease. My father's cholesterol is critically high. And I'm concerned. He's only 58. I'm concerned that he's not going to make it to 80 or even 70 because his cholesterol is 
like yeah. fatally high. They said he needs to do something about that, like now. And you absolutely can. I've been working yeah. with a couple of guys now. And one of my clients was a competitive client, so you know he's quite suppressed last year through competing. I've doubled his cholesterol from October to January, so his HDL has come up from 0.5 to 1.1, which is the bottom limit. But we've doubled his HDL in in three months mm. through supplementation. Mm. So you've got some incredible supplements out there: citrus bergamot, niacin, krill oil, omega three. Yeah. Obviously, you know dietary advice, lifestyle advice. It's so important. You've seen boys now in their twenties taking all the PEDs under the sun, and their their markers are absolutely fucked. Like I've seen- I know, I've seen, I've listened, I've spoken to some boys, and I ask them about their blood work, and they don't. Some of them don't even do it. They don't care. Really. Uh, and even blood, even good blood work doesn't necessarily mean that you know you've been on gear for the last seven months. You come off for twelve weeks and do a PCT, and have your bloods run, and your bloods are good. Then you go back on. That's still like. Do you mean it's still not? Even if your blood work is good, get a calcium score. Do you mean get an echocardiogram? Mm. That's what you're really going to see. How many boys are retired last year on the scene through heart issues and stuff? You know, so that's why I'd never do gear. I don't think because yeah. it seems to be a lot. Like some oh, people, some people just think it's all about um, pinning, and that's it. You know, some people are very ignorant of of the actual dangers of taking steroids. Yeah, and it's like you know and. I've had multiple surgeons look at my heart. My heart's not even in, you know, my 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 left side of my heart is perfect. Yeah. So no, it's slightly enlarged, but that's common in all athletes. It's the left side that kills you in the heart. But, yeah, because that gets thicker. It? So it, it, obviously it, it needs a pump harder. Mm. My left side of my heart is perfect. I just had a valve replacement. So people like, you know, there's rumours going around, oh, I was steroids or you had an heart attack. I didn't. I've literally just had a... That's, a val- well, that's what I thought, actually. Yeah, I didn't know, but yeah, the, 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 the valve... The val- I thought, I oh, just... Been smashing PEDs for too yeah. long. No, <laughs> and the valve will actually outglass me. It's 150 years in trials. They last. So it's a carbon fiber valve. Yeah, so, so they're gonna have to kill you off. Basically, to get basically, basically, basically. yeah, man. Now, <laughs> uh, yeah, but um, again, like, see, I never abuse PEDs, and you know, yeah. and I was always, you know, always train hard, and I always looked after myself. I always took good supplementation, but with cholesterol markers and things like that. You can bring any any marker out within blood work. You can bring it back in range. Mm. Hemoglobin, hematocrit, you know, your liver, your kidney, everything, cholesterol markers. This is why I do blood consultation. I advise and look, you need to get this, this and this to bring these back in range. Even like your blood, your body's producing red cells every 17 days. After 17 days, the cells die. They don't go anywhere. They just float in your body. So you're like a pressure cooker. So when you look at your blood work, you look at your hemoglobin, that tells you how much blood you've got in your body. So if that gets too high, your blood can get gloopy. This is why it's so healthy for males to donate blood mm. every three months religiously because when they take 450 ml of blood out of you, your body will regenerate that 450 ml within 24 hours. So it's like letting off a bit of the pressure. Yeah, then, so it? you're bringing it down, it's going back up, you're bringing it down, and not just that, you're saving lives by donating blood. Um, it's very healthy for males. Every, uh, every, I can't donate anymore because my blood's so thin. Yeah. Because um, I'm on warfarin, but... I used to donate blood every three months religiously. Yeah, my mother's tried to get me to donate blood a few times, but I just never got around to doing yeah, it. I, I, I ate it, you know, the thought, but it's so good. Like, I know, I just can't... think the fact of giving like a pint of blood is a bit... Yeah, it's 400 like, ml take, I think 400 to 450 ml. But you walk out there feeling amazing. Like, you literally, you yeah. can tell... The I feel difference. like we'll have to try this. Do you, know what, do you know what I'm really interested in? And I know I just said I want to stick to the basics, and this is the complete opposite of that, but I, I like, <laughs> I like listening... Have you heard of Gary Becker? Yeah. I love listening to, to to people who who can sort of like show you exactly how to optimize your immune health to feel like a, a million times better. Yeah. I love looking at like stem cell treatment and stuff like that. I'm interested in it. Is that is that just like a, a lot of bollocks, or is it something that can really transform your life if you do? Yeah, yeah. Things? no, stem cell therapy is completely different. But again, making sure you've got good blood work, which everyone can do. So you, you would know, recommend it then? Absolutely. To, to, just to, to anyone. Like, yeah, because it gives you like an internal MOT. Run your blood work once a year. What you know, it's, it's cost you. Thing is, the GP, like, and people get their back up with this, like, especially GPs who DM me, like, no, you're shitting on GPs. I'm not, mate. But you're, you're paying for that service. They'll never go as in-depth as what, like, Medichecks and Blood Lab and people like that will go. Yeah. You know, the, the one I use with Medichecks, with all my clients and that, is £150. They check for 48 different health markers. They check your CRP marker, your liver, your kidney, full cholesterol, full hormonal count, prolactin, testosterone, estrogen, free androgen index, all your red cell count, all your white cell count, everything. So it gives you like an insight into your internal health. Where is this, can I ask? Sorry. Many checks. So they send a kit out to the house. So they send a kit out to the house. 
if you know somebody like a nurse who can take the blood for you, you take the blood or you can pay for the service. You take it to the hospital, they take the blood, you put it in the post and you get the results back in three days. And I, you know, I've so always wanted to do I want to try that. this. Because I it's want a very good turn, yeah. quick turnaround. Yeah. And you're paying for that in-depth th- service. See? So, you know, with your hemoglobin, it tells how much blood you've got in your body. If that's too high, your blood can get thick. Yeah. It can lead to liver and kidney problems further down the line. Your hematocrit is like how much yeah. red cell volume is in your blood. If that's high, that can give you like heart attack and stroke. You know, by donating blood, it brings them two markers down. That's interesting. So when you I don't, when you take that. blood down, it'll bring your hematocrit and it'll bring your hemoglobin down. Yeah. It takes the pressure of all your organs, and then obviously your cholesterol markers. You got your HDL, your LDL, you got your triglycerides. That's massively important because that is what protects the heart. That's what protects against cardiovascular disease. Yeah, I just, I just feel like. I'm a, I'm a little bit paranoid. You know, if you run your blood... I, I, I done blood, a blood consultation last week with a guy and his markers are fucked. And I was like, it's the first time he's done it. I was like, how do you know your cholesterol has been fucked for three years? But that's what I'm saying now. I'm like, I've, I have, there is a history of heart problems in my family. And I'm thinking, right, if I, if I really take action now and make sure that... Because I don't know what I don't know. Yeah. Everything you're telling me yeah. now, I've, it's all gibberish to me I, I, I'm i understanding you but I've never yeah. heard this before mm. and when they go and see a GP this is the thing I'm concerned about my father he, I don't think he's been told yeah. a lot of the stuff that he yeah. needs to know and he's not seeing some stuff that you know they say oh this is bad your testosterone is low but I feel like if I go and get a test I'm just I can think I can see it now oh this could be a little bit better generally I think I'm in good health but evidence cost as well see, the, the one thing you should take from this your HDL cholesterol, your high density lipoprotein, which is your good cholesterol mm. that protects the heart, the bottom marker for that is one point one, right? If that, if you go below that, you're at risk of calcification. So you basically will get calcification in the arteries. You get plaque buildup. You couple that with a bad diet, ten years on the line, a bit of that plaque snaps off. You get a blockage. You're gonna drop dead. Yeah, you're dead. You know. So I'm seeing boys whose cholesterol marker is zero point five. So think of like the bottom limit now should be 11. There's boys 5, 6. So at risk of... So they're absolutely, paying yeah, more yeah, they're absolutely again. getting calcification on that level. In it's their like 20s and 30s. Yeah. That's what happened That's to my father. Yeah. He had to get a stent in there because there were blockage in his main artery to his yeah. heart. And this is why vitamin K2 is great because obviously, you know, it, it encourages calcium away from the soft tissues into the bones. You run that in synergy with D3. But if you've done your blood work now and your blood work's brilliant... Happy days. Just run it next year in in twelve months time. Yeah, you know. But at least you know them. I if know. Yeah, yeah. If, it's, if anything's out, you can you can bring any marker back in range with supplementation, lifestyle, and dietary advice. Yeah, because this is this is definitely an avenue that I want to go down. Sorry, don't believe that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, and, and not just that as well. If you go to the GP, even say you're looking at somebody's testosterone, right? The range is seven to twenty-seven nanomoles. And a guy, he's a client of mine. Um, He's only in his early 30s. He came to me, his cholesterol was out, and his testosterone was four nanomoles. Pedestrian. So seven is the lowest. So he was four. So at 31. So that's, like a, yeah. that's like a... Because George Osborne spoke to us about that. Yeah, he, he said shut, his was yeah. four nanomoles. Yeah, so he shut down. So basically, I done his diet. We implemented some good supplements in. 12 weeks later, he was 28.8. So I had him oh. from... Four nanomoles to twenty eight point eight yeah. nanomoles in twelve weeks without any drugs. Yeah. I love, I love, I love this. There's a guy called Luke Bellmer. He's all about biohacking, bio-hacking. and to, you know, trying to just, you know, even in improving like the water you drink, improving the food you eat. That's the stuff that's going to get you in good health. Not yeah. popping a a pill that thins your blood or stuff. You know, like and, that. The th- and the thing, like you know, the GPs will not give you health and lifestyle advice. Like my my friend went to the GP. And his ALT, his liver enzymes, were through the roof. And he was like, do you drink a lot? He was like, no, I can train every day. The days are the ALT levels are through the roof. Come back in two weeks, we retest too. His ALT levels were 168. I, he told me, I said, right, get some Tudka. Tudka's phenomenal. Gets bile out of the liver. Absolutely is incredible. Get some NAC L-cysteine. NAC is amazing for the kidneys. Two weeks later, went back to the GP. He went from 168 to 42. <laughs> GP was dumbfounded. He was like, well, "What the fuck have we done in two weeks?" He's like, yeah. "My mate told me to take knack and tadka." You just set ne- up your own GP. Probably. I know. <laughs> he would, he would ne- they would never do that. Like, I mean, I'm not saying all GPs are bad, but I even had my own experience in hospital. When I was in hospital, they came in and said to me one day, "Oh, your ALT levels have gone through the roof." And I was like, "Well, and it's you're probably telling them what you need." Yeah, it's antibiotics. Clearly, the drugs are pumping into me. He's like, "You know, it's really, really high." I was like, "No problem." I said, "I'll get my missus to bring in knack and cysteine." Uh, oh, well, we don't like you doing that. I was like, I don't care. It's phenomenal for the uh, for the kidneys. All right, we'll prescribe you NAC. I was like, what about folic acid? 
but you know, folic acid as well is, is brilliant for that. Oh, yeah, we will prescribe you folic acid. If I hadn't said that, and then four days later, my ALT was right down. Yeah. So... God, I'm tempted to just pay you to, like, give me a full <laughs> supplement start. I know, this is definitely something I want to pursue, you know, like the blood work you said, yeah. because I feel like ever since I've sorted my diet out now, I feel like I'm... I, I, I'm different. My brain is different. My, yeah. my, my brain is... I just want to be, like, the, the most high-performance, healthy version of myself. And I don't understand and I think, what's going on inside me. I don't know mm. what my markers are like. And well, I, I think, what, again, like, you know, this this attitude of, uh, you know, out of sight, out of mind, out of mind, out of sight. Yeah. These boys will gauge their health because they got a fucking six pack. Aesthetically, you can be the best shape of, you, of your life. Mm. If your internal health is fucked, then what does it yeah, even it's matter? Like smoke. I open a smoke yeah. as lungs. They'll be like, fuck, I need to stop. Yeah. Could look amazing on the, on the outside. Yeah. So, you know, it's for me, it's everything. And that's why I radiate that into my clients, you know, with coaching. It's the whole thing. It's you no know, blood work. In, I'm probably the only coach that runs intolerance tests, sensitivity tests. You know, the people, the clients I've got, you know, didn't know they were gluten intolerant, didn't know they were lactose intolerant, didn't know they were deficient in melatonin, biotin, you know, all these different things. And I correlate that data then over into their diets. It's like the most high-tech, science, scientific coaching. Yeah, but I just get. think, not even that. And it's like, you know, for what I charge, it's nothing compared to what... You know, some of the top guys in industry charge. And I know for a fact they're not doing what I'm doing. So where's this attent- attentiveness come from then for, you know, health and, and just really like, and the, optimizing yeah, your all? This this was even before what happened to me. I was going to ask that. Yeah. Did that make you more attentive? No, no absolutely not. You yeah. know, I was doing blood work even, and I've always run my blood work. I think I've just always, I think I've had that sort of um, awareness when it comes to health. Mm. You know, I've never, like, I've always prided myself on, like, somebody who's never, like, you know, been a, drinker and never smoked and you know and things like that and i just think if you're going to do something do it 100 percent, do it properly why cut corners like you know yeah i just think you're talking about the basics you know and i see like you know when i take clients on who be with other coach and stuff like that then just not doing the basics you know and, and that blows my mind like you know but it, it's so saturated now mm. and this is why some will do a show and become a coach you know and it's like Boys are there in their 20s being life coaches and you're fucking 22. <laughs> and boys are there doing the yeah. one show and they're giving PD advice. Yeah, because I'm interested in it. I, I, I'd love to get into coaching. I, I like the sort of, if I was to think of a, a, a route I would take in terms of coaching, I think it would be sort of your yeah. route. The only thing that comes with that, I need a, I need a good few years of experience now and, and, and real knowledge. Yeah, and I think with the way I look at it, I look at a client's physique like it's mine. I genuinely care. Like So I'm like, I am invested you. I know it's a two-way street, which coaching is, and we've got a, a business arrangement here. But I you know, I you know, you you know, you're taking PDs, right? Let's get your blood work done. I'm not fucking working with you unless we get your blood work done. Yeah. You know, I've got a duty of care. I'm not gonna do something with a client, you know, that's gonna detriment their health or you know, I've got a conscious like, you know. So yeah. that's my attitude yeah. when it comes to coaching. I really, if I'm on holidays the other side of the world and somebody, you know, a client is flapping or I'll pick a phone up and ring them or yeah. you know. That's the type of person I am. You've got to be like that though when you when you're in charge of other people, I think. And you've yeah, got but to I be, think have that. That's what's lacking in the and Everyone now, I think, because they see the money that's in coaching, they see them as a number. They see them, no, you're just a number, you're just a digit, you're an income every month. Yeah. You know, and I think uh that's a big problem as well. Yeah, where do, where do you think that comes from then that, that sort of this social media age? Because it's it it is a problem, you know, these well, days. Yeah, they're looking at you as a, as an income instead of actually I want to see you do better. Mm. I want to see you get healthy. You know, yeah. for me, yeah, you know, it's impressive seeing somebody with a six pack and, you know, big quads and things like that. I really appreciate that and what effort that goes into that. But me then, you know, dropping £40 off a client and improving his day to day life. And actually, you know, the guy I posted on my store on my page the other day, it was £40 down. You know, that's, he's the literally, yeah, increasing his longevity, mm. you know, your life expectancy. That as well. It ain't just all about aesthetics with me. You know, I take pride when somebody messages me and oh my God, like, I mean, I can fit in my dress, Neil. Thank you so much. I've got more confidence. You've got to be a certain person to be a coach. You've got to really care, like, mm. and if you're doing it for the money, you won't last long. No, and you your want... quality won't be there either. No. Yeah, so you've got to cap your your amount of clients yeah. quite low then so you can actually... Yeah, Give well, not even low. I've got a lot of clients. You no, know, They obviously check in over, over specific days. Coaching isn't easy. It's fucking hard work. I get it barraged all day, every You're day. You're basically absorbing the stresses of all Yeah, you know, and yeah. not just that. It's like, you know, imagine 40 clients messaging me at the same time. I've got to reply to 40 different people, 40 different conversations, 
Then they replied to my reply. Then I got people messaging me on social media. I replied to everyone who DMs me. Then I got, you know, trying to buy new business, trying to make reels, trying Go to train, podcasts. trying to have a life, come on podcast. I mean, all it's <laughs> PT clients, you know, it's it's not all, you know, it's made up to be, it's, time management is massive. Yeah, I think people sell it. I think it's sort of marketed now, online coaching, yeah. as a way yeah. to have be your own life. boss yeah. and make 10K per month yeah. online. Yeah, you see And it's those? marketed yeah. as something where you can step back and watch your business grow, but you're not. You're working more than you yeah. would be in a nine to five. Self-employed is fucking even worse. Yeah. Yeah, we can get on. We can get on to self-employed. Um, myself and Alex just recently quit our jobs. Yeah, well, we haven't. Yeah, but we've we've got to build the business now, me. So it's yeah. not like we've got everything in the pipeline. But it's just, I can, I can just. It's, you haven't got the security then. I mean, obviously, when you're established, you do. Yeah. But I just feel like at the beginning, I think it probably it might be a case of coaches just thinking, right, shit, I need to make some money. Let me just get clients, and they're not actually thinking about the service. They're thinking yeah. about how much can I make doing this? How many people can I possibly bring on? You know. I think, you know, I think a lot of people have a better platform to go into coaching. Like, I, you know, I I was established before I ever became a coach. Do you mean? Like, one month of titles, like, bodybuilder, I've been in magazines. And not just that, people invest in you as a person. If you're a coach and you, you're a bit of a dickhead and you, you know you, you haven't got a personality, you won't last long. You know, they, it's not just what you can do for them, it's you as a person as well. Do you mean? They invest in you. And this is why. You know, when you see how I carry myself on social media and the free content I give out and things like that, and I try to motivate people and try to be positive. You know, that's just me as a person. Yeah, there's not there's a lot of negativity on social media these oh, days, the and it is, is it is yeah. toxic and it's very annoying. You know, a lot of people just want to shame people and put people down, and there's and if you try to do something to help other people, yeah. people shit on it. Absolutely. Um, if I if I didn't look the way I did, nobody would probably give a shit about me. Like, you know, I, I even get hate and I get, like, negativity and, and, like, it blows my mind because even if I didn't like somebody, I would never invest energy into, like, actually commenting or making a fake account. I just think, like, it it, it just blows my mind that people out there are just that bitter. Yeah. That they hold that much bitterness and that much resent and jealousy. They have to go make a fake account or they have to, you know, anonymous message you something hateful. And, mm. you know, I've had like the anonymous messages, people saying, oh, you, you've taken so much gear, you know, your heart exploded and all this fucking shit. And I'm just like, yeah, you would never message me that in my inbox. I mean, so <laughs> that's a challenge. You know, and just, I, it just, it's crazy. I just think I haven't got time for that. I just want to lift people up, motivate people. Mm. And I walk my own path. I don't think I'm better than anyone else. I've got zero ego, and that's one of the worst traits I think in somebody is, is ego. I have no place for it. I agree. You know, and the industry is is full of it. And the thing is, you got to look like this, especially in this kind of area. Nobody really does that much for themselves. So when you can go in Tesco and you can open up a, like a five page spread, and I'm in Flex Magazine, yeah. people just don't like that. In a mining you know? town in Las Vegas. Yeah, yeah, you know, and you know, yeah, shooting in a ghost town for muscle and fitness and things like that, and you know, it's it's humbling. And but as I say, you can buy nice cars. You can buy nice clothes, you can't buy your physique. So when you've got somebody who's, you know, taking all the PEDs under the sun, training their ass off, and then they look at you and they think, hang on now, if I'm doing all this and I look like this and he fucking looks like that, he's got to be taking 10 times more than me. Yeah. Or they just, you know, they, and that's the thing, a physique is earned. It really is. And I just think, you know, that's the the social media era we're living in. It's a lot of a lot of hate up there, a lot of jealousy. Yeah, it's, it's definitely toxic and, and, and it's, it's there's no room for it really. I don't think you can let it occupy any rental space in your mind, otherwise it's not yeah. it's gonna throw it's you. It's hard though, especially for, for, for us. Because I'm looking at social media and I, I do deep down believe in, you know, the hard work and I like that's what attracts me to the uh, bodybuilding style trainer and just being in the mm. gym in general is that you don't just get something for free. No. And I like that, but I do feel like when I look on social media, people are saying get in shape, get shredded and in the next three weeks, you know, it's not that hard, just follow my plan. And it does sway me sometimes. I'm like, fuck, maybe it is easier than I thought it was. Maybe get, doing it long term is easier. I don't know. I just, it's hard for, for, for us because obviously, you know, you 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 learn the foundations and you were coming up Got before, years in the, game, before the, the, the reels yeah. and everything. But for us now, I'm seeing these reels and it does sway me sometimes because I'm thinking like, what, where, who do I follow? Where do I go? And I'm thinking, is the old school stuff outdated? There are people now saying that's outdated. You shouldn't listen to it. So then I'm thinking, mm. who do I listen to? I know not to listen to the 22 year old doing, you know. But you've got to look shit. at like, you know, when, in regards to that, you've got to look at all the everything we can look back at the old school stuff. 
I mean, we've only just started doing cuff work and all these fancy exercises. So say, let's you, you say that in 10 years down the line, but we can look back over the last 30 years and mm. know the barbell bench press and then bent over rows built millions of amazing physiques. So something was going right there. You know, back in the 90s, there was no supplementation and basic whey protein. Do you mean they were, I don't even think they were even taking creatine back in? Mm. You know, there was no social media. Look at the physiques back in. So they were clearly doing something right. And I understand evolution and things move on in supplementation, in training, but not everything has got to be optimal. You know, mm. when you understand the mechanics of a body and how it works, I just it just blows my mind when you see people in the gym and thinking, you're not even hitting your chest there. You're not even training your back there. Yeah. I just think like everything now is in the palm of your hand and everything is so much saturation. So it's probably too much information. As you say, We can't. I can't apply some of the knowledge like you. I can't apply everything you've told me today. Some of it I need to go away and, and digest. But maybe there's so much information for people who've just started day one going yeah, to the gym. Yeah, of course. They've all of a sudden, all there's this. so much information. Yeah. They've got access to, gi- to to kit as well, and they yeah. don't know what to do with it, so, so they don't know where to go. Maybe it would have been easier back in the day when all you had to do was go in, find a mentor, and they showed you the ropes. Yeah. Yeah, but I think I think you're not gonna get that going forward because this is the new age with so, physiques, yeah. with training. You might get the odd like you no, know, like where are, where are the, like the freaks that used to come up through the the ranks anymore? You show me one junior freak in this country that was like Flex Lewis, that was like Luke Sando. Do you mean like mm. these boys like you know like Nathan Diasha and things like that? You don't really see him anymore. No, no you know you can't look at somebody and think, do you know what? Oh my God, he's gonna be another Flex Lewis. He's gonna be another Luke Sando. Mm. You know, and look at the way that I, I had this conversation with Flex and Kicks before Christmas. He was about the push pull training. He's like, What are the bollocks? He's like, I've never done push pull in my entire life, mm. ever. Just get in the gym, just armor what you've got to train, go by feel. That's exactly what I do high volume, high intensity. I might do seven sets on one exercise when I'm feeling it. You know, there's no blueprint. You've got to do four sets, 15 reps. I mean, you haven't, and I think we all, you know, that's that's the thing. You, everyone now is, there's so much like, like overkill. Yeah. Out there now, when it comes to you know supplementation, training, coaching, reels, you know, do I do this or do I do this? Everyone's like trying to like reinvent the wheel. Everyone's trying to like yeah. climb and it's over confusing each other. Sometimes yeah. I'm not going to sit here and say, "Oh, I know." I mean, I'm 21. I don't know that much, so I am being swayed. But at the same time, you know, I've been training. I've seen a lot of the you know the influencers, and I I always like the more old school thoughts. I don't like the thought of going in the gym and doing these putting some cuffs on. I like the yeah. basic stuff. And that's the thing with me. Like I'm very old school but very modern in, in aspects as well when it comes mm. to supplementation, blood work, moving with the times like that. You know, I still train exactly like I, I've always trained. You know? And look at the put the video I put up yesterday. People ask me, how do, you, how do you build your legs? That's how I built my legs doing yeah, 120 kilo make, uh... Lunges. 120 kilo yeah, for the barber yeah. lunges. Yeah, that's insane. Some people can't even squat that. Yeah. And, and you're just barber lunges. Yeah, but they're probably putting, filling the, the leg press and doing half reps with, you know, You see that though. You them. walk into a gym, you see all the 20, all the 20 plates are on a leg press and then they've got about three inches of motion. motion yeah. But I see, I see them and I've never seen them under a squat track ever. They won't do it. Oh, and that's not just like, you know, you can't knock boys for doing that because they, they might be, no, they might have not been shown. No. But like, I think I've always had perfect form because I think I've always had a good understanding when it comes to like mechanics of the body, you yeah. know, when it comes to like, you know, like how I feel and how I squat and things like that. Not everyone is diverse like that. Even my training partner, Mike, like, I mean, I've brought his physique on in the last six months just from tweaking like his form and things like that. And he's like, oh my God, yeah, I can actually feel that even more now. People get into, old, into bad habits. Mm. If you're doing a specific range of motion, you've always done that. You're never going to go out to that kind of like concept then. Yeah. You know, because we are creatures of habit. We are. Yeah, we, we are. How has your training then changed since since uh, your event last year? And are you, have you are you plan to compete again or or, or not? Yeah, yeah. I don't know what I'm going to do competing wise. Yeah, I might go and upset tough. some people this year. Keep flying another. Aren't radar. you concerned though? Yeah, that that's maybe what I was ask. maybe you won't be able to do what you used to train as hard as you used to because of. But I can. You can. So yeah. there's no no concern about you Nothing. being able to go where you went. Last. Nothing at all. Um, like I've literally they've only replaced my valves. So from a health standpoint, yeah, I'm not taking like, you know, all the other PEDs I used to take, like Trend and Masteron. Not that I took a lot anyway, mm. or else I'll never take them ever again. But I know for a fact that I can go and go and win a show on a TRT 
on just TRT, which will probably upset a lot of people because yeah. if you've got somebody who's doing Anava, Winstrol, Grove Thormon, Clemputrol, Trend, Mastron, Test Probe, all the other things, and I rock up and I beat them on just doing TRT, nothing else, that's an hard pill to swallow. But I know it, for a fact it can be done. And, you know, like now, I'm, I weigh this morning, 256. Mm. And I'm a lean 256. Like I've got feathering in my quads at 256. You know, so my physique is like, I didn't come out of hospital and think, oh, I'm going to go back to like 264, which I was. Um, I just came out of hospital, couldn't train up a body for 12 weeks. I thought, if I can do anything in the gym, I'm going to do it. So I sat in there and I was just doing leg extensions. I think I was doing a full stack, like in, like, first week out of hospital. So I was just sitting down, doing leg extensions, doing hamstring curls, and then 12 weeks had passed. Then I started training up and I couldn't even curl five kilos. Whoa. Honestly, yeah, like because they were pumping things through your bicep, and they yeah, yeah through there, and not just that. You know, I'd lost twenty kilos in weight, yeah. and obviously you can imagine I've been sawn open. So, so your upper I, body was all fucked then, basically. Yeah, I, no. If I shown you, you'd probably think, "Oh my god, you're still in good shape." Mind. I mean, I, I might be a bit over dramatic, but I'd lost twenty kilos. I was literally I couldn't even do a side lateral with five kilos with a cuff. I was that, yeah with, with a cuff. <laughs> <laughs> I was that in that much pain, but I just persevered through it. I was like pressing, training. I literally couldn't do a cable like rear um rear delt movement because mm. I, was, I was getting agonizing pain in my collarbone yeah i think that might have been just my my um sternum flexing but i could do a full stack pec deck literally but like now i mean i'm literally but i'm probably in better shape heavier than i've ever been yeah there's a lot of people who will just find excuses you know there's there's no excuse to not to do hard no, work and i trained through pain for you know the last 10 months mm. you know and it got less and it got less and it got less and I was getting stronger and I was getting stronger and it's a bit of an anomaly because I'm, I'm only taking a small dose of testosterone every two weeks and I literally weighed 264 I was mm. and I was a lean 264 yeah I can see you lean now like it's and it was scaring you. me because I was 264 eating probably about two and a half thousand calories a day mm. I don't eat a lot and I was thinking, imagine I was pushing five, six meals a day, seven mm. meals a day. I'd be like 280 pounds. I don't want to be fucking 280 pounds. Yeah. I don't I don't want to be that. I mean, so um, blood work's the best it's ever been. Cholesterol's the best it's ever been in the last six years. I've had multiple echocardiograms since the surgery. Perfect. Everything. My warfarin has leveled out. It's perfect. I, I literally feel the best I've ever felt. Yeah. You know, and I do a low dose of GH as well. Which I've never ever done. Growth hormone. Yeah. Right. So okay. I done that last year for a recovery standpoint because it's amazing for bone health. And I've been doing that since last July. And I think that's what's kind of transformed my physique as well. Mm. Like I'm two I weigh this morning two fifty six and I've literally got nothing on my midsection. So if I dieted, I think I could do a show in eight weeks. Yeah, a lot of people would see that that event last year as an excuse to quit and yeah. just, you know, leave the game. But obviously you're 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 pushing yeah. on. And I'm thinking like if I compete, what have I got what have I got no, what have I got to prove really? Mm. Do you mean I've won everything? All right, I've, I've beaten boys who went out pros. Pro card was never a goal of mine. Um, because I knew that if I had a pro card, the level, the step up in competition is incredible. Mm. It's like starting all over again. And I know it would have took years off my life. And I were prepared to do that. You know, I always wanted to be a better version of me. Mm. Um so I wanna try and go and prove a point that you can win a show on TRT. And I and like if you saw me stripped off, it's, it's it's even I'm impressed and I'm my biggest critic. Yeah, it's like to think that I'm not even doing any cardio, zero cardio, eating about three meals a day, mm. and I'm literally like a lean two fifty six. Yeah, so is that what the future looks like for Mister Neil Arms? Yeah, winning th- a show on TRT. I think so. Yeah, I'm gonna I'll pull the plug at some point. Mm. Yeah, I will. I will do it. I won't take long to diet because if, if I started doing cardio you know, seven days a week. I would literally get shredded like that. Mm. I could look at a at a cardio machine and probably get lean. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. But at the moment, you know, everything's good. Training's good. Um, yeah, so I will probably do a show at some point. Yeah, is that will that be your last one then, or are you going to keep pushing on? I'm not sure. Day? I don't know. Mm. But the possibility seems to be quite endless. Yeah, you've got yeah. a lot of room to go and a lot of different yeah, directions think, to go. You know, it's crazy I'm that we're actually sat here having this conversation though when there was a point where you thought you may never speak again. May never speak yeah, again or even see the light of day again. Yeah, you know, and, it, and I think I do suffer a bit of PTSD from it. I wouldn't blame you. You know, and that, yeah. uh, you know, it, it's when they tell you like you're going to die, it's it's a f- it's a fucking hard thing like you know, I had to make a video of my daughter, you know, cuz she's in private school in Dover yeah. and uh it's 
it, it, I do like I get, I get triggered by a few things and like I got up a couple of weeks ago in the middle of the night went to the toilet and I got back in bed and I was I was shivering because it was so cold mm. and I, it triggers me then and think oh and I, like it reminds you when again. I yeah. yeah but then I get warm and it's, it's like it's people fine. people who have cancer and sometimes they say they feel some pain and they go fuck is it back and they say it never yeah. goes away you're always thinking about it you know it's, it's yeah. things that went on like you know I found a video on my phone the other day and it, it's, it's pitch black you can see like a light in the back and I must be filming myself in the night mm. and I'm I'm literally one of the other noise I'm making like every breath I'm, I'm like wailing if I can remember it happening it was like I was getting stabbed every time I was breathing in Ooh. I went through so much behind closed doors at hospitals so much I had to deal with I was shut off from the world and just simple things like you know I was in a room and I had a window you couldn't really see outside I was in there for three months was like cabin fever and you know, and, and uh, just shut off for my for my car, for my house, for my dogs. You know, and just from the little things in life. Yeah, it was it was it was crazy. Like, and uh, I do I think I suffered a bit of PTSD from it, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone would blame me for that because that is that is a terrifying experience. Mm. Um, I always like think all the time like what happens if life was just to end I mean because yeah. I, I haven't accomplished what I want to yet and it's when I go to the cinema for some reason I know when I'm in a dark yeah. room yeah. I sit there and I think what 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 will happen if I die like what is the point in this because I'm going to be dead Tuesday now it's going to be an hard day for me I think you know it's yeah. you know obviously split up with my ex-girlfriend who went through that event with me you know so being on my own on that day I'm actually going into hospital to meet Zaidi my incredible surgeon because mm. they call it like your heart anniversary so that's gonna be pretty cool, but yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a day of reflection and thinking like mm. it's it's hard for me to convey like the, the emotion. Oh, well, well, of course, yeah, yeah. You know when uh, you know, and when I, I can remember when I like I sat on the end of a bed with a catheter in, bollock naked, and I couldn't even wash my arm. Yeah. And somebody who prides himself on being so physically fit and strong, you know, as men, we're proud. Like I couldn't even wash my arm, and this nurse was just washing me, washing my back. And then like you know, I can remember like, when they took. My, when I first walked into the bathroom in the hospital and I saw my physique for the first time with this big bandage down here. Yeah. And it was an odd, it was an odd pill to swallow, like, because somebody who's analysed their physique all their life, you know, to then see me 20 kilos down, a trophied, you know, and just... This big scar. Yeah, but it was, I couldn't see the scar then because it, it, it had a bandage over it. And yeah. it was, it was, that was an odd thing for me to see, like, and... Uh, I remember then when he took the bandage off and I was like really like apprehensive because I thought it was going to be a big huge car, scar and you can't even see it now. No. It's nothing there. Yeah, I think... It cut it... me so good. The way they cut you in between your pecs, they don't cut muscles, eh? No. Yeah, it's just the stern number. Stern number like, yeah, so he, they cut me amazing. And I'm the only person, Sammy, my incredible friend, uh, she she works in cardiac under Zaidi. She's been there 27 years and she's the only, I'm the only person they've seen triple wired so basically, when they wired my sternum closed, mm. they wired me like a shoelace. So they put wires through the bone. So when you see like the wire on a on a champagne cork, that's what they've done. They've wired me and pushed the wires down. Still stay in me now for the rest of my life. Mm. Then wires and um, they triple wired me. So they only do that for morbidly obese people. But that's because you've got muscle mass. Yeah, and because they knew I was going to go back in the gym. See, yeah. so they triple wired me. So, yeah, I think a lot of people can take a lot of value from this podcast. Yeah, and like endocarditis, what I got, oral health is so important because, you know, the number three things they told me, one is heroin addicts licking syringes and injecting. Mm. So even PED users, you know, when you're injecting, you've got to make sure that you're swabbing, you're clean. Um, number two is oral health. Um, like I met up with a guy a couple, about a month ago, a, a guy, Damon, who I've known for years, and he had a rotten tooth. And his um, his root canal was seeping into his blood, Ooh. and he had exactly the same as me. He had a he had a um, he had a valve replacement. Mm. Your teeth are linked to your heart. Do you know what? I've, my dentist told me this before. I thought she was just going to get rid of floss. She said inflammation in your gums because I got gaps, right? So the stuff gets stuck in there. So inflammation in your gums. She said it'd be crazy if that affects your whole body. Yeah, and I was like, shut up. Yeah. She's a bit so of food the, stuck in the, there, right? The isn't it? second one is oral health, and the third then is gardening. People who got cuts in their hands, Some soil, soil, the bacteria in the soil goes in the bloodstream, latches onto any kind of leaflet, and eat your valve away. So, on a trick for that is done floss by a water flosser. What's what 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 is a water floss? What are you using the dentist? Because so, I do I do what he said. Now that now that you said that, because when you floss, I bleed all the time. Exactly, water flosser will make your gum bleed, but it'll blast everything out from your teeth. 
I'd got a water flosser because I had my teeth done in Turkey. So I had, um, I had my teeth done. Yeah, you've got nice teeth. Yeah, yeah. To be as orally as healthy as possible. Yeah. That's why. So they, like, they'd done any work they were doing it. I had, I had a two teeth extracted at the bottom. So I had all my teeth done. And they, that's what they said to me. Use a water flosser. You buy them off Amazon, 30 quid. And basically, you put it in your mouth and just blast water. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen them before. I'll brush my teeth and I'll spit out the sink and then I'll do the water floss and even more will come out. The brush can't even get to. I feel yeah. like you should yeah. make a book like on health hacks because <laughs> I feel like you know like a lot of different oh, I, things. I, I don't know why. I, this is the thing, see, the guy, I can't remember his name, but the guy I was speaking to said, you're literally like a sponge and you know yeah, so I got, much. I got so much information in my head, the things I shouldn't even know, like history, <laughs> geography, like facts. Like Give us a like, random fact, then he'll go on. One random fact. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Random fact. Um, I know loads. What shall I say? Um, what's the biggest fish in the world? I don't know. A whale shark. A whale. whale shark? A whale shark. I don't know. What I thought it was like. a blue whale. No, that's a mammal. Oh, yeah. We could do a little weekly YouTube video. We fact. should. We need, we'd have to do part yeah. two of fun facts. Oh, I've been in like conspiracy theories. Yeah. Like I've been on oh, the rabbit hole. Oh, you should talk Nine, to my father, but yeah, aliens. 9-11, like uh, everything. You, like, I just literally, I've got, I've got stuff from there I shouldn't even know myself. Yeah, how to avoid cuff laterals and, and yeah. de-handle pull-downs. Yeah. I want to get a worker in because I feel like I, you'll oh, absolutely yeah, yeah. blast us through it and I, I think that would be quite good. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know you train a warehouse now on Planet yep. Fitness in Tradiga. Um, that's a gym that we and Alex have spoke spoken yeah, about going it's, to. It's an incredible gym. That's why we go there every Sunday to train legs. Just for legs. Yeah, just you can go there for everything, but it's like fifty minutes to get up there. Yeah. Up, you know, up there. Where is it? Tr- so when you go up Neath Bank. Past. Fifty minutes from from here or from Swansea? No, it'd be even longer from here. So oh, it'd be so over an hour. Yeah, so yeah. you go down, you come off at Neath, and you go past Trade Centre Wales. Oh, fuck it, up, is hell of a drive. Yes, up, up there. And Might as well go to Cardiff for a session. Uh. Yeah, so it's go, go up up to Tradiga, but I would say like he's probably got like twelve different leg presses there. They've got mm. all the Panatta, they've got all Atlantis, they've got all the Jim Leeko with the new Swedish brand. It's yeah. incredible. I've used a hack squad from them. They're amazing. Yeah, they they got a real and uh, and the. Uh, is it the gym? The what's it oh, called? Oh, pendulum leg yeah, press. Yeah, pendulum. They got everything there. I've never seen a gym like you. It's incredible. It mm. is. And we go up there. I went up there to train back. Probably the best back session I've ever had. And I'm like, we only got once a week. And it's like, what do I train? So we just got better train legs. Yeah, it's incredible. Good atmosphere up there. Definitely worth going we'll up. We'll have once to go up and yeah, I will. Weekend um, for the session. I want to say thank you as well for coming on thank the podcast. You boys. Oh, absolutely. It. Thank you for your time and thank you for being so uh, open about everything thank you. and speaking about about your about your situation. I honestly, there's so many people are going to listen to this. People like us. People are going to be triggered as well. Yeah. Saying, oh, no, I like my calf flat. Throwing their like, yeah, you know, I think everything's, everything's got its place in it, I think, to me. But I think if you if you haven't got much of a chest and you're doing cuffed, you know... Clavicle pec flies. Yeah, you know, then you're, you're probably not going to have a chest six months later. Yeah. You know, you need a weight, you need hypertrophy, you need to feed that muscle, which a lot of people don't realise, you know. It's, it's not just training. You can train it until the cows come home. Mm. You've got to feed it as well, you know, through good nutrition, good supplementation. You know, people might not might be triggered, but there's so much you can talk in the realms of nutrition, fitness, supplementation. We'll have to do another one, maybe you know, go a bit in depth in the blood work and I think stuff. We should. I'd love to. I want to do it. I'm interested in myself. Maybe we can use one of us as a case study and do yeah, one, that'd of, be cool. one of us. Maybe go over your blood work. That would yeah, be good, you know? I think. I, I'm interested but, in yeah. that because I want to know. Markers, Let's do that then, because I'm 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 sold now. I'm gonna definitely get my blood yeah, done. 100%. So we might as well discuss it. We can we can do a video or something. Yeah, I think that would be good. But yeah. thank you, Neil, for your time. Yes, thank thank you so you. much. Yeah. It's been good to have you on. I hope everyone's taken some value from this. I know I definitely have. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be doing any calf lateral. We're gonna have to go over it and write down all the terms you've learned as well. <laughs> yeah. But uh, thank you, Neil, Appreciate and it, thank you everyone for listening to the podcast. And we shall catch you on the next episode. <laughs>